to the Writer's Block, episode 15, actually writing comics part two, brought to you by Ouch, the game of slivers. I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, Ringo award-winning creator of fine comics like Aberrant, Banjax, and The Jump, Voice in the Dark, the man in the box to the right is... David Avalone, also screenwriter and comic book writer, and one 352nd of a Eisner winner slash New York Times bestseller list. Wow, I, I don't even know what that means, but congrats, I'll tell you man. that story. Uh, we can talk about that later. <laughs> Excellent. Well, if you missed our last episode, our collaboration story show with uh, Stoker and Wells writer Steve Peros and uh, she creator Tucci, I highly suggest you back it on up and check that out. But we have a great show for you today. As always, Avalone, uh, bring the guests on, huh? Here we go. Alex DeCampi and David and... Pepos. Howdy, howdy. Hello, kids. Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I write comics. Um, I also uh, used to direct a bunch of music videos, and I write for TV and film as well, and novels. I now have my second novel, prose novel, is coming out this year, so I guess I do everything. Um, wow. <laughs> Multi Multi-hyphenate. There you go. The most recent comics I have out are uh, Dracula Motherfucker, a title I will never get tired of saying, which came out from right. Image Comics and has somehow despite being a grindhouse horror story, ended up on a bunch of um, best of lists, which just goes to show you how 2020 really was in publishing. Um, uh, I've just had Maddie, which is my collaboration with the director Duncan Jones come out from Z2 Comics uh, and an anthology called True War Stories. If you want a free comic, you can go to Panel Syndicate and download Bad Karma, which is my uh, ongoing Shane Black-esque um, action buddy comedy story. Um, that has three episodes out now. Uh, it's pay as you want, pay what you pay what you want, um, which includes free. I don't find out if you download it for free. We don't record your name, so like, don't worry about it. Um, and uh, chapter four comes out uh, in a few weeks. I'm lettering it this weekend after I get off this podcast. So that'll be almost 150 pages of comics. Wow, very nice, David. Yeah, uh, I'm David Pepos, I'm the Ringo Award nominated writer of books like Spencer and Locke and Going to the Chapel over at Action Lab, uh, my recent uh, Kickstarter campaign uh, for the OZ, and uh, my new book uh, out through Aftershock Comics, Scout's Honor, uh, which uh, issue one just came out uh, a, a week and a half ago. And uh, yeah, uh, otherwise, uh, just friend of the podcast and excited to be here. <laughs> Friend of the pod. We need to get yeah. you a shirt that says friend of the pod. Yeah. <laughs> I, wa I wanted to clear up for oh, with a crop, it would just say friend. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I almost wore my, my, my music by John Carpenter sweatshirt, but the only problem is like with the crop, you just don't see it. It just looks like a black sweatshirt. And I'm the only <laughs> one who knows that I'm wearing a sweatshirt that says music by John Carpenter. Now it is, is the my favorite sweatshirt. It is, is the sweatshirt a recreation of the title and the font from one of his movies? Nice. Nice. To clear up for Ryland what I was saying before, uh, I contributed one page to the very large uh, charity book, uh, Love is Love, uh, which benefited the uh, victims and the survivors of the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting. Mm -hmm. We won an Eisner and we were a New York Times number one bestseller. So nice. I claim one, like I said, given the number of people who worked on the books, I think 325th is probably a correct fraction. And Draco, who uh, to, who uh, edited it, was like, no, 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 just tell people you're an Eisner winner and let them let them do the research and figure out what <laughs> the hell you're talking Good for you, though. I've had five nominations and never taken it home. Very, very soon. But everybody remembers who Susan Lucci is. Does anybody remember any of the people that won? Like, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Susan eventually got hers. So She did. She did. Yeah, and I'm sure yeah. that'll work out the same way. Can so, I just uh, uh, can I address something for the video people before oh, you get into uh, my my four year old girl uh, painted my nails and they're and they're gorgeous. You're gonna see them flying around. Uh, I'm gonna put my foot up too. This is great radio. Nice. I got a rainbow on my feet. Really That's nice. Wow. Um, very very proud of her. Uh, this is life in quarantine. Um, so uh, <laughs> so enjoy them. I'm gonna be flashing them all all uh, all, all day. So very very nice. Yeah. So we we like to. We like to talk about process uh, because I feel like it's it can be pretty pretty impenetrable from the outside sometimes. Um, and uh, I myself came to comics pretty late in a filmmaking career and writing career. And uh, I've been reading comics my whole life and sat down, uh, sat down not having really analyzed them ever 
when I got my first gig and went, oh, Watchmen is nine panel pages. Who knew? Who noticed that? I've read it 300 times. That is never crossed my, like I never got it. New Frontier is three giant cinemascope epic panels per page. Fascinating. Never noticed it. So I came to it late and I did sit down and reread the Scott McCloud and the Eisner and all of that. But I'm curious about everybody else in terms of when you started, did you study it at all or did you pick it up by osmosis from reading comic books? I'm a huge formalist. So I went back and specifically studied comic books to figure out how they worked and why scenes that I liked worked. So I was sitting there panel counting mm -hmm. on like 2000 AD, on, on things that influenced me, which are not the things that influence a lot of other people, like 2000 AD, uh, looking at the pacing of a Naoki Urasawa page, um, figuring out how many panels it was, you know, making notes whenever, I, even at, like in a really dumb, like Mark Wade comic, when they'd really pull off a good nine panel grid, I'd be like, oh, checkerboard. Okay, saving that for later. Uh, I mean, it's the same thing I do when I watch movies. Like I can watch the dumbest movie ever and there's one shot. I'll be like, I'm going to steal that someday. And I walk off with it. So I just, I just have this like ongoing here. <laughs> it all starts in, this is my notebook. Um, and I jot down notes and ideas and, and just remember stuff that's like, oh, that's effective, you know. Um, so anything that's effective, um, I, I, I pick it apart to see how it works. Um, and were you doing that before you were writing comics? Was it something that you were? Yeah, yeah, like a little bit, you know, not as much. When I started really getting interested in writing comics, it was like, OK, how does this work? Um, but I'd always been like, hmm, like, why is this? Why is this scene so effective? Why do I like it? Um, right. Dave? Yeah, I uh, I mean, I, I studied a little bit of screenwriting in college. I was a creative writing minor, but um, I don't think I really got into it um, until I became a reviewer. Um, I, I was the reviews editor at Newsarama for uh, over a decade. And I think uh, I did pick up a lot through osmosis, just kind of reading and analyzing so many people's work and figuring out what's the stuff that I responded to and what's the stuff I really didn't respond to. I think that was just as important for me, kind of learning from other people's mistakes. Um, I also was really fortunate. I uh, I had a uh, an interview column uh, for about a year called Writers Workshop and Artist Alley, where um, I hit up writers and artists that I really respected. Um, so I got to chat with people like Greg Pak, uh, Rick Remender, um, Nick Spencer, Andy Schmidt, um, just to to rattle off a few names. And every single interview I did, I kind of picked up one really important epiphany, um, you know, from each creator. And I was able to kind of really synthesize that into my own voice. Um, and then beyond that, um, doing a lot of what Alex was saying, you know, taking books that I really liked and reverse engineering them, just saying, okay, how many panels are in this? How many word balloons are in this? How many words are in each word balloon to make sure that I'm not overcrowding it? Um, so I kind of have my own series of metrics, which might be different than something like a, a Brian Bendis book, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but that together with a lot of trial and error with a lot of short scripts that really kind of came together to help me form my own voice. Um, and then I keep kind of chiseling away at it book to book, adding more things to my, my bucket list with every title that I've put out. Um, and that really, I think kind of helps me keep growing and evolving as a writer. Yeah. It doesn't get easier. Like, like somehow you think it will, but it just no. <laughs> get harder because you start grinding down on things. I mean, for me, I'm one of the few, high level writers who also letter their own comics. And that kept me really, really honest about what works in a word balloon and also how much kind of post-processing I do on my comics. Um, the amount of work I do actually on the art when it's turned in, even when I have like on Bad Karma, when I have a really, really close, easy working relationship with both Ryan, the line artist and, and Dee, the colorist, the amount of changes I do when lettering the book, you know, it, it's pretty material either getting rid of text, you know, adding text. Sometimes the art carries it. Sometimes you don't need those words that you yep. put in there. Sometimes the art doesn't quite, and you need to put yeah. something in there, or you need to put something in there simply to lead the eye down the page, which is something you won't consider unless you're really doing a proper lettering script and looking at the art. And I've considered switching to an outside letterer because like I am the world's slowest letterer. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it would take me so long to create the lettering script to hand to the separate person I, sure. I have to pay them and I could just do the lettering script on the page like I'm used to um and I you know it, it's a pain in my ass but I find it tremendously rewarding because I'm also really into graphic design and I think it I can work with the artists to to present the most organic feel of of 
di dialogue and mm. words and art that that's possible. I think you bring up a really great point because, you know, they talk about how there's the movie you write and then the movie you shoot and then the movie you edit. I think that's exactly the same case with comics. And I think lettering in a lot of ways, you know, there's the, there's the comic you write and then the comic that's drawn and then there's the comic that's drawn and lettered. And uh, I, I can't tell you how many times that I've had to, uh, had to sort of make a pivot at the last second in my lettering drafts because I'm like, oh, either the art has sort of put its own spin on it um, mm -hmm. versus sort of the, the hard and fast dialogue I wrote or just realizing, oh, there's something that needs to be explained that yeah. just I, I, I didn't think of and now the art's here and I kind of kind of have to do a little bit of a pivot. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in full agreement uh, that it's sort of, you know, that last pass in the lettering oftentimes can really make or break a book. Um, and it's certainly, I'm, yeah, it's, I'm, it's, I'm it's very reading, important. Uh, for As research for something that'll probably never get made, I'm rereading Secret Wars. I'm sorry. Oh, it is like, it could make you never want to write a comic book in your life. <laughs> like <laughs> the writing is I so stop terrible. reading superhero comics. I just, it's, it's, it's like if someone gave a gorilla, uh, 200 Chris Claremont books and a lot of cocaine and left them alone in a room with a typewriter. It's so, the writing is so absolutely terrible. And, but it is a lot, a lot of it is, and I see, you see this so much in old comics, fear that the art hasn't transmitted the idea, sure. fear mm. that the audience like needs it explained to them what the character is thinking or feeling. There's no letting the reader figure out what they're looking at. It might as well be prose. Well, also there's, the a lot of, there's a lot of like, nice. in the big comic companies, there, there's, a, there's a lot of siloing of like the writers and the artists and the letters and like nobody talks to each other. Like you don't mm -hmm. talk, to, you, you don't get to talk directly to your writer most of the time. Mm -hmm. You hand your script uh, uh, or your artist, you hand your script to the editor, the editor sends it to the artist and then to the letter. And, and, and sometimes they don't even send it to you for a lettering pass. Sometimes the editor mm -hmm. just does the lettering pass. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is outside writer's control. All, and that doesn't, you know, necessarily make it all okay. But it also, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons uh, Cape comics are like they are. Yeah. You know, it, it, like all they care is it, it, it's on time. That's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, yeah, and, uh, no, go ahead. Go. Oh, no. I mean, I, I was going to change the subject. So if you're making a, uh, if no, you're following I, up, I go was ahead. just going to say that, you know, we, we had an episode of, of a couple of episodes back with John Lehman, who's one of the other great mm -hmm. writers who letters all of his own stuff. And, uh, with, uh, Taylor Esposito and he was one of the greatest letters and they talked a lot about that about how you know what people don't know or don't understand about lettering and again I, you can see a great comic and still think this lettering isn't good and I wouldn't do this <laughs> you know this mm -hmm. isn't how I would do this this is you know even things you love i can read an alan moore comic and go i'm never going to make a comic like this i would not i have no interest in oh, making there's a, a comic lot of stuff like you can do to influence uh, how the reader's eye goes down the page and what they stop at so rather than having to have someone make a comment about i'm picking up my keys if it's not obvious you just add a sound effect to the keys being clanking as they're picked up right. so the reader's eye the reader's eye will look for text so if you've got a very, you know, often a silent page works best not as a silent page, but as, with some sort of environmental noise in it, if nothing else, just to make the reader stop and make sure they're getting all the information out of that page instead of skimming past it. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you set your balloons on your tiers should take your eye from the top left down to the bottom right. If you change that, there are all sorts of reasons why um, you would do that to emphasize a point or to, to break things up, um, but, you know, clear reading order and, 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 charting the reader's eye down the page or like it's a real art it's 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 fun it's fun but it's you know yeah. it's a yeah. lot of people you also out. you do also need a uh, an artist that has at least a passing understanding of that of how much know, space yeah. to leave for words not just how much space to leave but also where they're leaving the space to be proper eye trace sometimes they will mm -hmm. leave the space on the wrong end of the panel where the where the text is going to drag your eye back left when it wants to be moving right or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a real, you know, I've worked with very good artists who were not great at prepping a page for, for a letterer. 
and getting everything. I feel like it's an epidemic almost, you know, yeah. really great artists that just do not have that understanding. Again, every, a, 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 every artist should be forced to sit in a classroom <laughs> and just, yeah. just learn and that. Sure people coming out of the siloing of mainstream comics where they are doing a monthly book and they never have to worry about what happens to their art once it leaves their hands. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the worst I've seen in terms of the few times I've worked with people who have done like 95% superhero work and nothing else. That's the worst trouble I've had fitting the letters on the page. It's they just did not leave room. Um, or they left room in weird places, or you know, it was just frustrating. I mean, I mean, I would prefer to work with people who are writer artists who have done their own books um, because they generally are much better about leaving space. I mean, Carla Speed McNeil would pencil in the letters, and yeah. she'd do much more interesting effects when I did. I mean, I, I, I sort of feel like I need to credit her um, to for, for ninety percent of my lettering skill. The rest being Jeff Smith. No, I, I do like it when artists sort of. Go. just in case you were curious balloon one is mm -hmm. supposed to go here balloon two is supposed right. to go here balloon three is yeah. like do whatever you want letterer but this is what i thought was thinking when i was doing mm -hmm. it and uh yeah no it's it's uh the coordination thing i will say that probably the most applicable skill from filmmaking that i brought into comic books a lot of my filmmaking career was in post-production and was in editing mm -hmm. but also in overseeing as a producer or a director, the post-production process of a movie. And that that project management skill of yes. seeing the layout and seeing the inks, yes. seeing the colors and seeing the letters and giving cogent, coherent notes that can be understood by the team that go, oh, okay, mm -hmm. that's what you wanted to express in that panel and I, I missed it. Let yes. me go back and make sure that happens. Yes, and giving those notes as early as possible so it's oh. on the layouts, you know. Yeah, so they, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I've I've worked with artists who- I, mean, I, call, I call shots in my scripts, you yeah. know. I mean, most of the artists I work with are good enough that they could do their own visual pacing if I left them to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I always present it as, I'm gonna call the shots if you're not used to like basic cinematography, one-on-one -on -one shot sizes and directions, um, you know, here's a glossary um, and, uh, if you disagree, like this is this is my basis to make sure that I've done a good job. And I put this in here to make sure that I have given you something that has reasonable visual pacing. Because um, also early on, a lot of what I was doing in terms of like close ups and reaction shots that I brought in from manga were not really being done a lot in Western comics. So people were like, can I drop the reaction shot? And I'm like, no. Um, and never also the came out of storyboarding music videos I was going to shoot and then edit right. them um, and short films. So, you know, it's presented to the artist not as you know you must but here is my way of doing it if you can think of a better way you are more than welcome to do it because i'm lettering it and i can just wing it on the back end so right. um you know some days you get up and you like some days you get up and you're like i'm going to totally revolutionize this scene i'm going to be the greatest and then some days you get up and you're like you know what i'm really hung over and not feeling it and so my script is there as a safety net for the days that they're not feeling it yeah. um no, and the longer but, I find that the longer you work with the same artist, it's like, you know, I was the metaphor working with the director of photography. The first time you work together and they frame a close up, you go, nah, I want it actually a little more like this and a little tighter and a little more like this. The 10th time they frame a close up for you, it looks like it did after you fixed the first one because they have figured yeah, out. And then, and then also after, if they're a good DP, they went. Here's my rationale for having done that. I, I hear what you're saying. Let me suggest this slight amendment to what you're doing that fulfills what both of us want because I want to also do this because of that thing in frame and block. Sure. And you go, oh, okay. And then you know you have that that communication where where you're, where you're really talking as equals in terms of like being in service to the story. It's never about being in service to ego. It's never about like right. I am right and you are wrong or I know more than you do. It's like what are we gonna how how are we best going to tell what our story objective is and make it the most effective story you can. As, as long as everyone hangs to that, which almost always on my teams they do, mm -hmm. um, the joys of picking my own teams, um, you know, everyone has a really good time and everyone's respected and everyone feels like they're contributing. No, absolutely. And that's, and that goes for every member of the team. And, uh, you know, the, the first, very first comic script I did, I sat down and drew the whole thing terribly in stick figures but I wanted to make sure, having never written a comic book before, does this all fit on a page? Like, am I, is this the right number of panels? Am I asking for something physically impossible? 
and I only did it for like the first three scripts because it was working out. Like I ne and I never showed those sketches to the artist, by the way. Because I still work things out when I'm doing something experimental. Like I've done some weird stuff where I'm like, is this really gonna work? Right. You know? And I will actually I often draw my own. Sorry. Oh, I was okay. gonna say I, I often draw my own panel layouts. Um, and I still do it for every single script just to make sure that like the math is adding up. To right. all of it and figuring out kind of like what's the big money shot of a particular page yeah. that you want to yeah. emphasize um but yeah i mean it's 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 uh it's always interesting to have that kind of give and take in the back and forth with, I with think what you said about money shots is really interesting because this is yeah. something i talked about both in film directing and in um at comics is it like you don't want i i you know, I work a lot with Tony Parker, who I love, but he wants mm -hmm. every panel to be a killer. And I'm like, yeah. give me, give me, give me four meat and potatoes panels, and like we'll we'll have one be the killer, and that allows that one killer to breathe. Yeah, you know, yeah, be one of the angles on the splash pages. Yeah, you know, that's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. and I, and not even just splash pages; it's like within a page. It's like you know, <sighs> having like the big I action shot or something is, like that. You know, is 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 the old Roger Corman master and two pups. You know, a couple of over the shoulders, and then you do one really interesting bit of movement, and everyone remembers that, and it's got the room to breathe in the scene, and everyone goes, "Wow, what a good shot!" But you're not going to remember that if there were like eight other fancy shots competing for you. Yeah, yeah. No, it's all it's all about budgeting, and in, including the things you're budgeting. One of those things you're budgeting is the audience's attention yes. and what they are going to think. And, and also, if if every if every panel is a mind blower, that means every moment is a mind blower. And no, every moment can't be a mind blower there, yeah. or none of them are. That's the, you know, it's exactly, yeah. it's all, it's, it's all. It's a rhythm. And, and I will say I've, I've had pretty great experiences with letting go of, uh, I've told this before, but like when I was having Kevin Eastman do layouts on something, when he volunteered very nicely to do layouts on something I was writing for him. Uh, and I got to writing the first action scene and I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell Kevin Eastman what the panels of a ninja fight scene should look like. I, I think I'd like his version of that way better than my version of that. So I'm gonna let that, you know, it's like when, you know, film directors have, uh, there are action movie directors. There are definitely real action movie directors. But a lot of people who are revered action movie directors have a second unit director who actually did all the stuff you thought was cool. And they don't know the first friggin thing about laying out an action scene, really. Uh, mm. And then there are guys that hand, you know, people who hand a pile of storyboards to their, uh, to their people. And, uh, and what the second unit or the action director is doing is just serving the vision uh, or collaborating with that vision. But a lot of times people who have killer, you know, killer reputations as action directors. And then you see, you read the credits and you go, well, the, I they talk about Charlie's Angels, you know, directed by Mick G. Sure. But Vic Armstrong directed the action scenes and Vic Armstrong's been making Indiana Jones and James Bond movies for 30 years. Well, it breaks both ways. I mean, you also you also have you know you also have guys that are just guys and gals who are just shooters, right? You have yeah. the the uh, like you know a a Antoine Fuqua is a is a, a, a pretty notorious one where um, you know when when Antoine is off kind of making random film, it it looks beautiful, but uh, you know the story is is incomprehensible. The the acting's yeah. not great. When you pair Antoine Fuqua with Denzel Washington. And and Denzel is in there making sure the story is 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 tight as can be. When when Denzel is is noting up the script to death, when Denzel is sitting across from Ethan Hawke actually directing Ethan Hawke in the scene, you end up with Training Day, and you end up with Oscar nominations and Oscar wins and the whole nine yards. And um and then uh, you know and then that's why when Denzel has a passion project, Denzel can hand it off to a director that is going to want some uh, you know modicum of control. Who he's going to have to argue with over things, or Denzel can bring Antoine back in, <laughs> and Antoine is Antoine's going to shoot the shit out of it, and that's all mm -hmm. Denzel wants, and he's going to handle the rest of the film. And then you have like Ridley Scott, who who sees every scene in his head complete as he was like before going into the movie. You know, I don't even know how much he boards it, but like, you know, from, from what I've heard from people who've worked with him, it's like you ask Ridley what's going on, and he like just tells you in detail. <laughs> Like the whole film is there and he's just making it, like he's just putting it there in reality. Um, and 
you know, I, I'm no Ridley Scott, but that's how little bit I am with comics. I mean, there's the flexibility of going into the collaborative process and I rewrite a ton um, constantly um, and polish. Um, but, you know, one of the other weird things I do other than lettering is I write the entire script before giving it to somebody. So, you know, Bad Karma was 275 pages. Once we did the first 10 to just show it off, like I just went away and I wrote the rest of the story. I mean, I had it outlined anyway. Um, but I wrote it and gave it to the guys. And since then I've just, I go in every couple of weeks and I'm like, yeah, I can fix this scene a little bit. And it's not, you know, it's not going to change the ending of the story. It's not going to change a major plot point, but you know, we added two pages to the end of, uh, chapter four that the, it's about to drop. And I rewrote the last four, the last two pages going into that because they were rushed and there was a better way to do it. Um, and I'm really pleased with a better way to do it. It looks great. It's a little bit formally innovative kind of riffing on nine panel grids until it isn't. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think especially because I do a lot of thriller um, stuff that having the entire book really helps me because also every time I, you know, when I get to the end, I want to go reseed stuff in chapter two. Um, no, I, and then I've, had, the, I've like, had the experience. Oh, I have to explain something that I forgot to explain. Right. I get, I, I've had a lot of uh, experiences where I've been kind of rushed, uh, where they, you know, the, the, the good news, bad news of uh, my uh, editor, my senior editor at Dynamite, Joe Ryband, is he doesn't, he doesn't waste my time on projects that aren't going to come to fruition, which also d means he doesn't tell me about things until they're a lock, which means I'm not ready. <laughs> and right, I have yeah. to sort of, you know, there are some comics I've made where I, you know, I threw the lettuce and the radishes and the carrots in the air and then ran around with a, a salad bowl for three issues, catching a salad and going, I think, I think I threw enough ingredients in the air in issue one. And I think this is going to be an edible salad when I'm done. And that's actually worked out okay for me, but it's the more time, the thing we just kickstarted the Omega ma'am, we had forever to work on it. And it was glorious to have forever to work on it. Yeah. And uh, Dave Acosta, the artist, brought so much to it because He's he so had good. the I love time. Him. I him the time. You know, he had he had the time to say, "Hey, how about this?" And even when all of the art was done on the last page, he said, "It's too bad that we didn't set up this one particular plot element." And I looked, and I was like, "I can I can make that happen in the lettering <laughs> and the coloring. <laughs> I can, we can I can I can." Do, there's a villain who's like a cult leader and the cult is made up of people who have, who have this plague that turns them into orange skinned zombies. It's a ridiculously political Trump thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the last, as we were coloring the last page, he said, wouldn't it be great if he was faking it all along? Like if he painted his skin orange just to lead these, this army of freaks. And I was like, Oh, I wish we could make that happen. And I went, Oh wait, I can, I can have the, you know, I said, told the colorist, I want regular skin tone showing, you know, and the orange dripping off his face. Just, just do it in color. And it, it ended up working, but it was like, man, I wish we'd had that idea four months earlier, <laughs> but you can still yeah, make that's it the thing about slow comics is like, I, I know I work very differently from other people. Cause I just go, you know, I own all the rights to the stuff I do and I make it real slow. I it, it, it takes as long as it's going to take. And, you know, when we're done a book, we put it out and the books are big. Um, so, you know, I'm able, like, I've written it far enough in advance that when I'm actually getting close to each chapter, each chapter is getting drawn, I can like have a fresh eye on it. And so there's this constant ability to re-examine it because I've got the space to do that. And I know that's really rare. Um, it's not massive, like it's, it's, I don't know, it's sustainable for me. Is it sustainable as an industry? I don't know. But yeah, I can recommend. Well, I, 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 yeah, I would almost argue. I would almost argue that in a lot of ways, the industry is moving uh, in that direction. I mean, I think Pepo, you and I have kind of had conversations on this, where uh, you have a lot more people that, I mean, for the very reasons that that you're talking about, Alex, are going out and doing their book, right? Um, uh, you know, one. Um, I mean, I think that we're we're in this place with the industry, right? That it was kind of like where the music business was when Napster became a thing. Right. Where it was like we had this era where five big conglomerates con conglomerates controlled all of music. Right. And if you didn't get your single, I mean, if you didn't get your album with them and your single on the right radio stations, then you were nothing in the music business. Right. 
it's, it's not the case anymore. Uh, uh, those those conglomerates they they um, you know control kind of like a small piece of this massive pie now, right? And and most of the musicians that I know, very successful musicians, they you know they they record their music in their basement <laughs> and they throw it up on you know whatever Spotify or or, or iTunes or whatever, and it it you know it a record label is never involved. They are the record label, right? And yeah. and and you know, so I can see in you know in 10, 15 years, uh, uh, you know, the comics industry being in that place. We are in this place now where things are starting to fracture, where the the you know these publishers have less control. They're becoming less important, and the opportunities for you know people like us to kind of just make our own book and and in some cases take it directly to consumers or 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 just skip kind of that that editorial kind of like hump, right? Um, uh, yeah, you know, I like I, editors. I, I, editors are good, like a good editor sure. is weight in gold. Um, but also I think another aspect of it is the increasing, the sad but increasing irrelevance of comic book stores in the monthly market. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially over quarantine when people really couldn't physically go to stores, um, you know, that really helped out with graphic novels. I mean, we were we were really happy that, that, that Dracula Motherfucker was like, you know, a, a fat little graphic novel. Um, cause people can buy them at bookstores as well. I mean, you can order them from your comic shop. Um, but you know, you can get, you can get things mail order and that and web comics and, you know, like the kids, et cetera, are all in webtoons and tapas, you know? Yep. Yeah. I, I feel yeah, like no, the, the, even the brief career of my, my creator owned book, like we, we, the first volume we kickstarted, we sent the Kickstarter fans, the four chapter graphic novel. And then, like someone who was raised in the 60s and 70s with monthly comic books, I dutifully put in previews, cut it into four issues, put them out month to month. And when we did the second volume, I was like, screw that, man. We're sending a trade paperback out right after the Kickstarter. Like, we're not, we're no monthly. It's, it is the time and energy, especially on a month, on, a, on an indie book. Uh, to, mm -hmm. to kill yourself to sell 5,000 copies. Uh, yeah. And even if you're not losing, and you know, because of Kickstarter, we literally couldn't lose money on it. Every dollar that came in beyond shipping and handling and printing was, was, was literally free money, but it yeah. was still a lot of trouble, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it just, you know, and we had a one shot that uh, was particularly attractive to the market that likes. Eastman's work and my work, and that sold. I'm freezing up. I think you yeah, are. You're, fr you're, you're freezing okay, up, and your, uh, your 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 audio is a little choppy, also now. And, and the one shot sold really well as a floppy, and that's mm -hmm. great. But uh, I don't know that as a in the in terms of creating our own stuff that I ever want to do that. If someone yeah. wants to pay me a great page rate to write a comic for their company. I will happily do that. And so many of the mid-sized comic book companies now seem to be after a deal where it's like, hey, we don't pay page rates, but we'll publish the thing you kickstarted, to which I always think, well, what do I need you for, though? <laughs> well, that's say, always... yeah, it was kind of what I was getting at with the music thing is that is, you know, the um, I mean, there are certainly things that publishers can offer us uh, and and particularly certain publishers. Yeah, I mean, I live in a warehouse, like I live in Manhattan, like I can't take a thousand Kickstarter copies of a book or 6,000 copies yeah. of them out. I could when I lived up in Maine, not here. So you well, know, the uh, publishers are, are doing bookstore distribution for me, like, you know, but also I brought the deal to them and the deal for us is very good, as you can imagine. It's not the like, we'll publish your Kickstarter book for, you know, 50% of your profits. And also, by the way, we'd like some of secondary. Like, no, like, nice try. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what you're getting at is, you know, is, um, I mean, a lot of these, you know, a lot of the deals, particularly with smaller publishers are are, are, are very predatory. I mean, the, that's just the bottom line is that, you know, they get people that, that they, they want, you know, they want to be legitimized in this business. They want to, you know, they, they think that means having your book in a comic shop. And that's very important. And that was the end all be all. Again, that was the, you, you needed to be with a conglomerate. You needed your, uh, you know, you needed your song on this radio station. And if it wasn't, then you were nothing. 
and 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 that used to be the case in you know in in comics. I mean, it, 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 it was not not in a comic shop. That was the you know that 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 was the end all be all. But that's not the case anymore. That the, the whole thing is changing, and about half about half of us see that it's changing, and the other half we don't yet. You know, yeah, well, I, I, mean, I I always say that your first two deals in the business are bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you take you take a shitty deal to be published. Yeah, uh, pretty much I, everyone has. Like I signed the Tokyo Pop deal. That was a bad deal. Um, I think continuing to sign the bad deals makes me question your your understanding of how the business works. Because I've seen people sign with folks I know who are a predatory publisher, um, and who <clears throat> whose rights deal I know is terrible. And then they're on their fifth or sixth book with them. And I'm like, really? Like, yeah. you're going to do that? Like, they're they're never going to take care of you. I mean, I could, I could someday, I, like, I'm going to sit down at a convention and I'm going to, like, whiteboard how the option process works and why when your comic book publisher is controlling your secondary rights, even if theoretically you're getting 50% of the option, like, you're going to get totally screwed. Um, and where the, like, where, you know, I will eventually just, once some of my deals are public, I will break down, you know, like where the money goes and where the money comes from and why, you know, I mean, there's a reason I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm on an EP deal for most of my work. Like the option that you have, like if, if, if your publisher controls the rights to your book, they have an incentive to option it for as little as possible, especially to their, co-owned production studio in order to maximize their production, their, their, their producer fees. Um, they're throwing you a bone. Congratulations. Pat on the head. You got a TV series, maybe. Um, and then, you know, you go away and, and feel all happy with your like $5,000 check. Um, and, and there are people making many tens of multiples of that off your IP because that's how the business works. Again, like the recording industry. Wait, you are doing this? Really bad deal. I heard uh, some publishers were taking, would subtract from your option fee any money, like whatever your publishing was in the was in the red, and your publishing is always in the red with these companies because none of these monthly series make money. Um, so they would say like, oh, well, you, got, you know, we're optioning it for $5,000. However, you're still $6,000 in the red from your, from like, you know, your comment, your six issue miniseries that we option. So actually you don't get any money, but now you only owe us theoretically a thousand dollars. And I'm like, that's like, wow, that's, that's some, that's some bullshit. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yes, please, please seek decent representation and don't sign away your secondary rights kids. Mm -hmm. The only way you're ever going to buy a house from comics is either write middle grade stuff with lots of fart jokes or to hold on to all of your secondary rights. Dave, I know you've had some experience with with that. I don't know if you can talk about it or if you're still <laughs> mid deal on things and don't want to talk about it. There's there, there's only a limited amount that I can talk about. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's. Uh, I mean Alex is is right that it's like you know when you break in, you're kind of you often you're taking your lumps and you're kind of figuring out unless you're really lucky enough to kind of walk in on the image deal, uh, which I think is getting harder and harder and more competitive all the time for people who, who are trying to break into that. Um, yeah, you're kind of figuring out, all right, some of it's self-selecting, you know, there are publishers that are just not gonna like what you have to offer and that's totally fair. It's not, it's not the thing that they're looking for. But um, oftentimes you're kind of figuring out, all right, like what's, what can I live with? in this case and 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 in terms of the the rights that i'm giving up or the the the, the work conditions or the, the the pay or even in the, the the case of you know the the overall floor and ceiling of your sales um you know uh, ryland and i can can attest you know we each got our start at action lab that's a small place um you know really the sales ceiling for those kinds of books is usually in the 2000 3000 range um, whereas if I had, if my first book was at Aftershock, for example, which we, we broke 10,000 copies on, on my first issue, um, you know, that is automatically going to be kind of a, a different kind of rodeo. Um, there's also things like, for example, is the publisher going to pay you a page rate in advance? Are they going to pay for the art team? 
uh, you know, those sorts of things also wind up when you're putting your foot in the door. They can kind of help you make a, a more informed decision. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, you know, working at a place like like an image or someplace that will uh, agree to negotiate on the secondary rights. That's that's the bar that everybody should be reaching for. And it's, uh, you know, it's I, I understand that there's the business realities that every publisher is going through and just like comics creators say, this is how I really make money. Um, I know a lot of publishers are saying this is how we really keep the lights on. Mm-hmm. Um, and and. So it's it's a tough road to navigate. It's a tough needle to thread um, because, yeah, you want to make sure that every book that you do, you don't want to take a step backward. Um, you don't want to take a step backward with your rights. You don't want to take a step backward in what you're giving up um, because, yeah, otherwise, you know, you, otherwise people will kind of take you as an easy mark. And um, I think going back to sort of the, the, the impetus for this line of, of, of conversation, I think things like Kickstarter, for example, it is a, a nice kind of uh, leveling of the playing field because now you're not really feeling beholden to any one particular publisher. You don't have to wait for permission anymore. You don't also, even have to. Also, a lot of the, the shittier publishers will hold some tiny measure of like economic benefit over your head in terms of like, if your artist is a full-time artist, I mean, a lot of writers do other things, um, but art, you know, Vita Brevis wrong but like art takes a long time um it takes a day to draw a comic book page usually um so you know one issue of a comic is a month of somebody's life um they they can't be paid in exposure unless they're unless they've got a partner who's working and supporting them and even so no one likes to be paid in exposure so you know the the, the shitty comic book company says oh you want to work with so and so well we'll give them 150 dollars page rate which is still a really shitty page rate um but you know, you have to like, if you're gonna give you a page rate, you know, we have to take secondaries um, and, uh, or we take a share in secondaries, but don't worry, it's creator owned, um, which it isn't, by no, the way. It's not. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's owned by a corporation now. Um, yeah. So so this is this is one of the, the things that David was referring to earlier, which comes into this, this the writer as producer mode and that you're, you're, you're not only finding your line art, color art and potentially lettering team, you're also having to figure out economically what they need to work and to go to the, the drawing table gladly every day um, and deliver it to them. Um, and that might mean kicks and, and also what you're going to give up on rights. Um, and everybody's different. Like some people really want to work for certain publishers and they don't care about their secondary rights and that's fine. Everyone can go with God and be happy. Um, but you know, you have to figure out all like, it's, it's not just like I have an idea and I found someone to draw my book. It's, you know, I have a good script. I've put together good, reliable people who, whose references I've checked with other people to make sure they don't ghost or are weird or like don't listen to women because I've had a few of those. They're great. All caps emails. I am in charge of all the visuals. I fired him like that day. I was like, bye. Um, uh, you know, you then have to figure out, you, you then have to take, you, you build a team um, and then you have to take care of the team with the deal you get. Um, and that's that's possibly the toughest part because there are so few good deals and there's so few good like, the deals that treat, you know, I mean, I have trouble and I'm like vaguely a name. I can, I won't say names, but twice in my life, I've had creator on projects at companies and the senior editor at the company has been a friend, a good person and a good friend. And they had that as the senior editor of this company, oh, freezing again. Hold mm-hmm. on. Come on. Here I am. I think I'm back. And they have been to me as the senior editor of our, this company. I am so excited to launch into this project with you. As your friend, I'm telling you to run screaming from this deal because it is terrible and we will screw you. And I've gone, thank you for that information. I will send an email to the legal department declining the contract at this point. Uh, and they were right both times. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I still own those things 100%. Uh, and, uh, some of them have been published. Some of them haven't, but it's still, you know, I, I go back to my, my indie film days and it just was always really obvious that distributors were counting on your exhaustion. They know you just made a movie. You used up all the money that you raised. You, you just, you have nothing left in the tank. 
You have nothing left in the tank. And uh, they know that no matter what you put in front of them, you're going to go, oh, yes, please, just take my movie, put it in theaters, do whatever you can. And it's, you know, I produced a movie in, in 2014, 2013, with, uh, you know, some mid-range stars in it. I produced it through Kickstarter. So the, the actual, like, investor budget that needed to be paid back was maybe $35,000. It hasn't reached $35,000, according to the distributor. It's been on Netflix for five years. It's been on Amazon for five years. It hasn't recouped $35,000. Available as a Ray sure. DVD for five years. I just got a royalty statement from them last quarter that said they owed me finally about $200. <laughs> I know that feeling. Take your, wife, take your wife out to dinner. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, and not, not, not every deal is bad out there. Um, you know, there are, there are companies that are, uh, that are better than others. Um, you know, I mean, there was, uh, I was just looking at a deal from scout comics and, you know, it have a lot of, uh, you know, good people running scout comics. And, um, I mean, one of the things that was really interesting to me about it was that, um, it was a five-year deal. Right. Um, so, I mean, with, with with most of these companies, the predatory companies that, uh, that 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 we've discussed, I mean, it's like they you know they they own your shit outright for you know in perpetuity, like you know forever and ever, uh, amen. And um, you know with Scout, it's like, well, we're gonna take the rights for for these five years, and at the end of five years, like if we both agree to continue this relationship, it'll continue. And if not, then it's yours. It, it comes back to you, and um, you know that that's been it's been a huge thing. The 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 revision clause has been a huge thing for me in my film career because um, I mean I've told the story before on the uh, on the pod, but but for the sake of of discussion, um, I have been a working screenwriter in Hollywood for fifteen years, and when I came into the industry. Um, you you wrote a spec script, which meant that you, you wrote a script without you know anyone hiring you to do it. And if it was good, or if it had a good idea in it, you took it out and you normally sold it, right? Or you could go out and you could sell a pitch uh, once you had a couple of those sales under your belt. Um, and then the writer strike happened right around the financial crisis, and uh, Hollywood completely remade the uh, the way they they did business. And suddenly you couldn't sell a spec to save your fucking life, right? And this coincided with the IP revolution, meaning that like every Hollywood movie had to be based on something like a, a, a novel, a video game, a comic book, of course. Um, and I had a few lean years and eventually um, I, uh, I I sort of got wise and I was like, well, okay, if Hollywood wants IP, I'm going to give them IP, right? And so I, I took this idea that I had been trying to sell as a movie for, for a while and knew I couldn't sell it as a spec or a pitch and I wrote it as a short story. Mm -hmm. uh, I got the short story published and literally like the next day we have a bidding war. We have Justin Lane coming off a uh, 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 Fast Six, which was the largest uh, opening in Universal history on one side. And we have Brett Ratner and Robert De Niro on the other side in a bidding war. And Tyler Perry was in there making offers and blah, 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 but huge sale. Um, and uh, and this then very quickly became my business. <laughs> Generate IP. Uh, and, um, and, and so, you know, most of the stuff that I've been paid to write in Hollywood, you know, over these last, uh, uh, uh years have been, um, has been stuff that, that existed as something else first, whether it was a, a, a novel or a short story and, and, and now comic books. Um, but those revision rights have been huge because the, the story we sold to Justin Lin, we, they optioned the story, they pay us a big chunk of change to, uh, to, to, to write the script. Um, and then these these A list directors are great in terms of making sales, but they have shiny ball syndrome, right? We would have Justin's uh, we'd have Justin's attention for a minute and a half, and then he would be like, "Oh, oh, you know, uh, uh, Star Trek, you know, <laughs> we, we 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 have his attention for five more minutes, and then he's like, uh, you know, uh, 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 this TV series, um, oh, this Mountain Dew commercial, this, you know, and then you know, and then suddenly like a year's gone by, and and you're you're nowhere, but those revision rights." Right. Uh, after a year, the power comes right back into your hands. Right. And so after a year, it, it is our choice. Do we want to stick with Justin or do we want to try to move somewhere else with this thing? Right. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, if I had sold Justin Lin a script, they would own it again in perpetuity, like forever and ever and ever. But mm -hmm. because I have this piece of IP and I control this piece of IP and and like you said, I have good representation and my lawyers have negotiated for for these revision rights uh, mm -hmm. after a year. 
it comes back to me. And long-winded way of saying, uh, we have we have sold that same short story twice since. And, uh, and, and as I was sort of saying to, to, to the Davids here uh, uh, before we started recording, um, I am now uh, on the one yard line with a TV series, uh, 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 you know, with David Diggs and, and, and Lionsgate having sold this short story for a, uh, you know, for, for a third time uh, that, you know, that I've written and I'll, I'll be running and, and, and the whole nine yards. And so, um, and so, so that is just sort of a, 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 a case study, right? You know, I think, uh, I, I think, you know, having as much control as you can o over the property is a huge deal. Having good representation is, is a huge deal. And, and making sure that you're dealing with people, again, like I, I think that Scout Comics, uh, uh, you know, they, they are, they're playing it straight as much as anyone in this industry can, can play it straight. And hats off to them. And, um, and you know, I, I, I would say that everything is a negotiation, right? Um, of course, your, your first deal uh, I agree. You got you got to kind of take what comes. Uh, you know that said, with you know with my first deal, um, I was lucky that I was coming. I, I'm coming with a piece of IP, and my business had for for more than a few years at that point been generating and selling IP to uh, to um, um, and so I came to. Let me shut my phone off because it's distracting me. I publisher with this piece of IP, and I said, look. You know, I would like you to publish this, but I, I'm going to set this up in Hollywood. You know, I I, I guarantee I, I I'm not some guy who who made who lives in Idaho who made a comic book, right? Who has no inroads or anything like that. Th this is a uh, this is my business, um, and so you know I am bringing something to the table here. So I was able to negotiate a better deal than most would get. Uh, you know, in that situation, and it was very important because. Um, a week before my second issue hit newsstands, we had the book set up as a TV series with Tony Krantz. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, if I hadn't negotiated that deal, I would have got hosed. Right. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, like I, th I think it's really starting to become a tier of like people struggling just to even break even doing comics and not really seeing any other way of getting beyond it. You know, folks who have a lot of series with these the comic book publishers that have taken their rights and therefore they can't really get representation because they don't actually have anything to represent because like a small indie publisher owns has control of all their secondaries uh and folks like us who have gotten you know who have things we can sell and have a good team behind us um and it's just it's just splitting off really hard um in in the way comics are working um because yeah, I mean, I you know, I've got a book coming out in April. We already closed the deal to do a TV series on it, which I'm running um, with a major studio. Like, that's pretty cool when it's like you know, it's, it's four months before the books come out, and it's you know, even going through a major studio business affairs department, we managed to close it. And that's impressive. You know, for those of you who have had that lovely experience, it is akin to watching molasses drip in February. I will. I will say that though the the whole ip revolution thing even you know when i moved out to la 34 years ago even going back to the 1930s hollywood has always had a lack of respect for itself and a greater respect for every other an artist coming from every you are more likely to be impressive in hollywood if you published a book of friggin poetry that got on a list somewhere than if you're a really good screenwriter that's been making movies for a while because yeah. it's just like there's just some weird like if I I once was I was looking at I've been I've been enjoying some of my screenwriter friends who like who all also have this issue with IP, um, but who you know have been more successful but are now trying to find homes for things that, that normally would have just been a spec they sold. Um, uh, wrestle with trying to write prose um, because screenwriting to comics is not that hard because it's words and pictures like you know how to do this if you're a good screenwriter and you're telling it with the pictures. And you know, possibly have done some directing and storyboarding, which I think helps enormously in in that process. Right. You know, you're kind of set. But then, you know, having the, old, the whole interiorism of a, of a novel, um, or or even a short story, where you're trying to, because the worst part is you know what you sound like as a screenwriter. You know what your voice is. I mean, Rylan, like you've been doing this for 15 years. You know what your voice is, um, David. You too. Um, right. Like 
then transferring that voice to prose was some was like that was a wild journey for me. Like I, it, it took me a lot of writing just to finally be like, okay, because my 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 voice in comics is very spare. It's a lot of silence. It's a lot of telling with pictures. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of like only dialogue, no captions. Because um, I know a lot of the, the the younger comic writers now are just like just like entire issues of captions, and I'm like, bless you now. Um, and I wrestled with it for a long time until I finally, 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 like about 75,000 words in of just like exploration to be like, okay, this is, this sounds like me, mm -hmm. you know, finally. So, yeah, that well, I think we're, I, I, I think we're hitting on a key thing here too, um, that, you know, it's a, I, I think it's a point that we've made before, but it's always nice when it's like, so, you know, wonderfully illustrated here is that, um, I think in order to, sur I mean, this is called the writer's block, right? And so this yeah. is an important point to survive. You know, again, I mean, you talked about buying a house, uh, uh, you know, as, as a writer, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to do. You know, I mean, there, there's so many of us who, uh, there's so many of us who, okay. Yeah. I, uh, whatever I, I run a, uh, I run a factory floor and I come home and I write in my spare time. There are plenty of those people, right? And, yeah. and, and that's, and that's how they fill the, pay the bills. But, but those of us who actually make our money writing, uh, it is a minor, you know, fucking miracle, uh, uh, that we do this. And it, it is, it, you used to be able to do it, but you cannot do it anymore. You, you can no longer just be a screenwriter. Um, you can no longer just be a comic writer. You can no longer just be a novelist. There, 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 there's an exception to every rule and there are a handful of those people, but it is so rare these days. And, and let me tell you, so, you know, I, I went to the American Film Institute Conservatory, right? It's, 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 you know, it is, it's one of the best film schools in the world, if not the best film school in the world. I got hired to, uh, you know, I got hired to write a huge movie about halfway through, uh, AFI, right out of AFI and then started off my career. Uh, and, and, you know, we had a, whatever, a 120 person class in different disciplines and stuff like that. And, um, you know, and then again, like crisis hits, writer strike, uh, financial crisis, all that stuff. And there were these people who stuck to their guns of just being a screenwriter or they refused to adapt. They refused to do anything. They're like, I'm a screenwriter. I'm just going to sit and write screenplays and screenplays and screenplays. And they didn't, you know, they didn't adapt. And all of those people are now back in Pennsylvania selling insurance or whatever. Those of us who stuck around are those who, who sort of mutated, adapted, to, to the new landscape, and the new landscape is this, is that you have to be a writer. You can no longer be a screenwriter or a comics writer. You have to be a writer. You have to tell stories over and over and over again in whatever medium uh, uh, suits it. If there's an opportunity in this medium, find, you know, find a story for that medium or find a way to make your story suit that medium. You know, don't, don't, don't try to jam square pegs in round holes because there are too many of us who do that. There are too, you know, too many idiots who, who, you know, okay, I have this failed screenplay let me turn it into a, uh, a terrible graphic novel. There are plenty of those people and that's not what I'm talking about. But, um, that was like the last five years of vertigo, it was amazing. Like really guys. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I have not had to do anything but write for, for 50, for 16 years now. I bought, I bought a house in, in Los Angeles, uh, which is, which is no small feat writing, you know, uh, uh, writing things. And, uh, and, and, you know, I have, uh, I mean, the, the number of things that I've written, the number of different things that I've written, genres that I've written in, uh, uh, arenas that I've written in. Um, uh, yeah. So if there's one piece of advice that I give to any writer, it is that just be a yeah, writer and not a screenwriter. Like even, even within your existing discipline, um, you know, whether or not you're moving into other things, like, you know, if you do monthly comics, do a graphic novel, do a web comic, do a strip comic, like keep pushing your form in every way you can, you know, try a short story, write a poem, like, you know, try a screenplay. You, like it, it never hurts you to keep experimenting and to keep pushing that envelope. It only makes you a stronger writer because there's, there's lessons in all of it. Yeah. yeah. No, and I, I, I also, I mean, anyone who's seen my IMDB page will know that I I'm willing to do whatever is interesting to me at any given moment or will make me a buck. Uh, but I, I wouldn't trade my four years as a grip for any, like that was my military service that like I, I had an experience of movie sets that most people who go on to direct will never have. Yeah. Uh, I've been an assistant director. I've been a camera guy. I've, I've pretty much done everything except makeup and wardrobe on movies. And I have found that, indispensable in my experience as a writer and as a filmmaker the more experience of the world you can have in general i mean this seems like yes. such an obvious thing to say but being just a screenwriter or just a comic book writer and only reading comic books and not reading novels and not reading poetry and not watching like 
your stuff becomes so airless and so like you're sealed in a vacuum tube. And when I, you know, the opposite of what you were saying, Alex, when I started writing comics, coming from movies, I was very, uh, I was cinematic in the sense that I never used captions. I wasn't even crazy about sound effects, to be honest. I liked the picture covers it, and then I'll write the dialogue that we would hear if we we're watching it in a movie. And the artist I worked with the most, Dave Acosta, was like, let comics be comics, man. Write a caption every now and again. Like, don't make me have to draw every single plot point, even the ones that are kind of boring. Like, you can say... You to skip time as well. Like, and yeah, they're, they're that's really... That's cool. what he was like, talking about. Again, you know, like... like Having the whole comic in captions, like I question whether oh, that's yeah, a no. comic. That's that's a um, whole that's a whole other that's a whole other style. Sound effects, like I find incredibly useful. Like I, you can build so much atmosphere with them. Just in the same way that, like, you know, oppressive room tone in a thriller when you're waiting for something to happen suddenly becomes very effective. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of of environmental sound in films. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've used, I've brought a lot of that into comics and also like manga is so good with it. And it's, it's such a useful tool for, for pinning the eye to certain points in the page. Oh, totally. No. And that was a great point you made earlier. I've not, I haven't thought of it that way, even though I have used it that way. The example, you, you know, of wanting the audience to see the guy, the guy's block. So you put a little yeah. click right next to the thing. So just in case they don't just see a guy standing at a door, they see they notice the key in the lock because you put a sound effect next to it. That's a, that's a great yeah. point. Yeah. You know, I, I think overall, and this, you know, applies to everything that we've talked about. I always think about Kurosawa got his lifetime achievement award and he was maybe 80 years old at the Oscars. And he said, this, this is really encouraging. <laughs> and it's like, dude, you've made 10 of the greatest movies ever made. And he actually said something like, this really encourages me to continue my studies and keep trying to make better films. Yeah. Yeah. You're always trying to make a better book. Like and it, every every book, you know, once you once you finish it, can't you rest it, on his laurels. You yeah. can't rest on your laurels. Like be more yeah. like Kurosawa and think you always can learn something more. There's always something for you to see. Uh, and again, like I said, I was reading Secret Wars. Reading terrible comics is also a great learning experience of like, yeah. all, all of this is terrible and I shouldn't do any of these things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a good way to synthesize your voice, if, if nothing else. Um, just saying yeah. this, is, this is not my bag. And so it kind of makes you not write that way out of spite. If yeah. I mean, I'm direct by, go by, by, by working as a PA on terrible film sets. Yeah. You know? No, and you see, you see all of the terrible choices made. You see all of the terrible, the complete lack of management skills uh, that most people sadly have. Um, you also see people, and this is an aside about movie sets, but I think it's a lot of things. People assume that there's a persona they need to have in certain jobs. When you to be a first AD, I would tell people I was a first AD, they would say, oh, everybody hates you on set. I was like, if I'm on my head, everybody likes me. I don't know. I, I kind of get people to shut up when I say shut up by the fact that they respect me and want to make me have a better day. You know, like it's yeah. So there, people think you have to be a certain kind of. You know, it's the one of my least favorite things: the artist jerk cliche uh, that people think they have a license to behave a certain way. And it's like fact, no one, no one, no one ever method acts somebody nice. Yeah. Exactly. That's a really great point. No one ever goes, that's weird. I'm playing a nice guy and I, you know, I still need everybody to avoid me on set and not make eye contact with me. It's strange. There you, go. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think that uh, we've talked about this a lot on the show, but you know, the, the, I've worked with a lot of artists who have said to me, and I'm, this is not me patting my own back. It's just a, it's a reflection on the industry and what you were saying earlier, Alex, about the siloing. I've had so many people say to me, I have never gotten so much feedback from a writer and like actual encouragement and kind words and yeah. hey, this looks great. I mean, that's the thing, like Dave Acosta I think that's an me, important point to make in terms yeah. of the writer-artist relationship is even when the page is garbage and doesn't work, like you find one thing to compliment for every one thing you criticize. Always leave, you always leave the compliment. The compliment. Like this page yeah. is wonderful. I really love like, wow, that car is amazing. It's perfect. Um, I'm worried about this over yeah. here that might not, you know, but 
And so, that's the, and that's also how you put that is perfect. It's not panel five sucks and doesn't make any sense. It's I'm concerned that it's unclear in panel five that he's getting in the car. Yeah. You don't yeah. say what the fuck is this garbage? I don't understand what I'm looking at. You find the way to say um, what, you know, what to convey what you I'm, want. I'm concerned the reader might miss the story point, essentially. Yeah. That's, so that's what it is. You can amplify this or change the angle so that it's more clear that blank, blank, blank. And, uh, you know, and that's actually, that's an, there's a lesson I learned on my last student film where I had two mm -hmm. actors, one of whom I had miscast he was a very sunny, happy guy, and I literally had him playing like a grizzled veteran. And the guy playing his sidekick was great and was perfect. And after the third day of shooting, the guy playing his sidekick said to me, I guess you really hate what I'm doing. And I said, what made you, why would you say that? I haven't given you any notes. He's like, yeah, you're talking to the other guy all the time about his performance. And I'm like, oh, right. I have to remember to tell you how great you are every day. And that's not about like, insecurity that's simply about someone who's doing a job for you yes. they have no idea how well they're doing or how poorly if you don't say this is great you can't just say well i i haven't told him i haven't told him it's terrible so obviously he should he should yeah. extrapolate from that, that if, I, if i go away if my if my mac fell asleep i don't have the okay. point out here and i don't have a plug nearby so it might just go bye bye uh <laughs> that was, i'm sorry <laughs> But yeah, I mean, also, you know, comic books are a long slog process and, and that page that you're criticizing, someone spent a day of their life on. So, you know, you you have two obligations. One is to get back to them promptly with notes and two for those notes to be kind and constructive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think sure, but, that artist... but, 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 but if something's garbage, you got to say it's garbage. I think I've started relationships with artists where I've said I want to see the layouts as as you finish them where they've gone like, mm, I'll send you five at a time, maybe, or 10 at a time. And there's a little bit of resistance. And I don't think they realize I'm trying to save you time. If you send yeah. me every layout every day and I say thumbs up, you're not going back to the work from five days ago to fix something. And exactly. you're not inking exactly. something that I don't like and that doesn't tell the story and that's not good. So all of the like, I call it an approvals process, but really, 90% of the time, my feedback to my artist is, hey, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Know, and sometimes, sometimes it's um, as simple as like, look, I I did a bad job scripting this, um, and I'm really, really sorry, but like, I don't think panel four is working the way I wrote it. Would you mind changing it to this? Because, you know, it's not always it's not always the artist's fault. Sometimes what I what I wrote was unclear or sometimes one of my layout ideas was bad. And you have to own that and be like, look, I'm sorry. And I also try to put as much photo ref in for the artists as I can, especially because like, I mean, Bad Karma, for example, is, is uh, concerns to army veterans. So there's like really, they have really specific kit because I have friends who will write me in and be like, Alex, that's the wrong kit. <laughs> I love my friends, but also they've all baited it. So they, like they should, they should know better. But so, um, yeah. but yeah, ha have people beta your scripts, especially subject matter experts and fucking pay them, even if they're your friends um, uh, and be like, it's not the artist's job to Google. Like you should, they should not be spending their time Googling shit. You Google shit, put it in the script. Yeah. Don't say you have to do that, but like, here's an example oh, of, yeah, no, but here's, save, the car, here's the background. Yeah. Oh, here's this bit of th thing I know about. Oh, I took this photo for you. Oh no. yeah, save them, save them that time. I, every comic I do, I open up a Pinterest page for it. And I mean, especially because like, like you were saying about army stuff. Hardcore. Hey, talk amongst okay. yourself. Okay. I've done a lot of period stuff and you just, you need to, uh, you need to save the artist's time. And especially if there's someone under 35 and you're asking them to draw a telephone from 1953, they don't necessarily have that information at their fingertips, you know, and you need to, you know, you need to make it easy on them to do that. I've also done the thing of writing comics that take place in Los Angeles. And I routinely like, get in my car with a camera and go to the place that I'm describing, you know, and I've even been as ridiculous and going, okay, so panel three is this picture. Panel four is that picture, you know, going around town and, and, and collecting all that reference uh, because they shouldn't, again, it's time, as you said, drawing a page takes a day. The minute they have to look up, well, what is a 1952 Studebaker? Well, I don't know what that looks like. It's like, 
go to the page there, you know, every prop, every, you know, every, uh, every location, every prop at the very least, every once I mean, in a while, I'll, I'll even do, uh, if costume stuff is super vital to the story, sometimes I'll let it go and see what they have in mind. Uh, but a lot of times it's like, I think this dress would look very nice on Betty page. Yeah. I don't think it hurts. I, I don't think it hurts to give, uh, you know, an artist more information. I mean, you know, they can, they can toss it over their shoulder if, uh, it, it, you right. know, I guess that's their prerogative. Ultimately there might be an argument later or something like that, but, but, but the more you can do to just let them know what's in your head, I think, you know, particularly in a creator own book, I think is a, a, a good thing. I mean, my, my scripts, again, I come from a directing background. I mean, I, I studied directing at the American Film Institute Conservatory. So, so I, I, I treat each one of these things like a little film I'm directing. In fact, you know, Pe Pepos and I have uh, have more than a few times. Uh, uh, and, you know, even at uh, at um, San Diego Comic-Con, we've done this panel uh, uh, called uh, Directing Your Comic Book, where I sort of cast the, uh, you know, the, the creator own writer as uh, the director of his or her book. And, um, and you know, the metaphor kind of trickles down from there. And then uh, what Pepos does is immediately disagrees with me and argues <laughs> the other side of it. It's a, it's a good, it's a good panel. Uh, yeah. I, I, I always been really well received, but um, but but you know what I do is I mean all of the things Pepe, I'll hand it off to you in a second here. Sorry, uh, is um, is uh, you know I prep these things like I would prep a movie, like I used to prep movies, uh, you know, and it, 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 it you know it sounds like uh, Alex does a, a similar thing where it's just um, you know everything that I would give to a cinematographer, to a uh, to a costume designer, to a, a production designer, I just put it in the script. You know, I mean my 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 script for a for a twenty two page comic. Is going to come in over fifty pages because there, 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 there are so many, um, you know, uh, uh, so many pictures and so many references, and and it just helps them know what what's in my mind. Pepo, see, we're going to say something. Yeah, well, I, you know, for me, it's always so much of the way that I do my work is is often intuitive versus like any you know hard and fast rules. And so, so much of it is kind of, you know, what's the temperature of the room? What's the dynamic that you're having with your particular artist? What's the strengths that your artist has in particular? Um, and that can kind of really affect, I think, the back and forth that, that I always approach um, with my team. Um, there are people like Ruben Rojas, my artist on, on the OZ, where um, he's always constantly saying like, oh, if you've got any ideas, throw them at me. Um, if there's any particular influences or reference that you want, throw it at me. Whereas, for example, my artist in going to the chapel, he he was he was like, I don't need it. I'm good. Like I can he can really kind of take the ball and run with it and take his own spin on it. And I don't think there's any there's no wrong answer for it. Um, it's just kind of trying to be as nimble as I can be as a writer. Um, so what do you enjoy? You know, I mean, yeah. I, I, when, when Erica and I did Dracula Motherfucker, I, I came with this entire aesthetic and gave her this entire spiel about how it's actually about super flat art and the 2D versus 3D push pull. Um, and, uh, you know, here's all my references. And by the way, if you've seen this anime and that's that's going to be like the showgirls poster. Um, and we just got along great. Like I, I kind of threw a bunch of uh, references at her, said this is this is aesthetically what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and then she just ran with it. So she had, she had a basis. Um, you know, I, I was just trying to inspire her more than anything else rather. And I think that's the goal. It's not, it's not dictating. It's inspiring. Yeah. Um, no. And you, and you absolutely, it's about being on the same page and making the same yeah. book together. Uh, you know, in the, the, the furthest I've ever gone with reference is I did a four issue run of Elvira where she went to hell and that was four, four issues, a hundred pages or 80 pages of drawing hell. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was like, this is too big for Pinterest. I'm ordering you a copy of Gustav Doré's illustrations for the Inferno. And I just want that. <laughs> like in the, in as, in as much as you can do that, obviously I, that's very complex, but I was like, what hell looks like and how the sky is dark instead of bright. I like Doré nailed a lot of shit that you don't have to reinvent the wheel for. It's got to mm -hmm. look different. It's got to look modern. There are a lot of modern, like, you know, I had the, the circle of the raffle is a traffic jam instead of what Dante had because time has moved forward from the 16th century. But the ability to just go, here's another artist who did a really great take on this. I would like you to adapt for our work. He was like, send me some screen grabs. I'm like, dude, it's a 200 page book. <laughs> like, I, I'm, yeah, not gonna, yeah. I'm not going to painstakingly screen grab 200 pages. I'm just going to order it from Amazon and have it delivered to your home. Um, 
and it really, you know, what he did was his own thing. I think you could look at it and see the influence. And there are panels where I said, you know, when she gets to the ninth circle and it's Satan sitting on his throne on the icy plane, I was like, Dore's version of this is pretty amazing and iconic and you should just do that. <laughs> you know, sure. just adapt that, you know, change it around a little bit, but uh, this works and it's amazing. And it's, you know, it's something that has, there's a reason this has been in the culture for 500 years and you should, we should, we should draw upon that. But, you know, the, we were talking about this earlier, the greatest thing about the relationship with an artist, and it's the same when you're on a set and you're watching an actor do a take and they do something you as the person who wrote the script and directed the movie, you had no idea they were going to do it. And it completely and changes the movie and it's better. Exactly. You know, yeah. I always point out that the two most indelible moments in an Indiana Jones movie or, and at least in the Han Solo characters, those are both created by Harrison Ford. Yeah. Yeah. Shooting the swordsman and saying, I love you. I know that's Harrison Ford. That's not Lawrence Kasdan. That's not George Lucas. That's not Steven Spielberg. And if you asked anyone what their favorite moment in Raiders of the Lost Ark was, at least in 1980, Everybody or eighty one, everybody had the same answer. Yeah, um, it was true. It's always on. Yeah, and it's uh, you know, and so being lively to the moment when your artist does something and you go, holy, the, you know, in the same Elvira comic, we use actor cameo imagery a lot, and mm -hmm. I had a, I had this whole sequence set on the RKO lot while they were shooting Bride of Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And it had a ton of celebrity cameos in it with, you know, jokes that I thought were very funny. But I had two ND security guards written in mm -hmm. who show up and our Vlad the Impaler character tosses them around like 10 pins and all this. And Dave drew Abbott and Costello. And I didn't tell him to draw Abbott and Costello. And when I saw that page, I literally laughed myself out of my seat. I was like, and I actually changed the dialogue so they identify each other as Chick and Wilbur are the character names from Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and Dracula because how, of course, how because it was right there. I could yeah. not. But the fact that it never occurred to me to make those two security guards someone interesting and yeah. to make it, it, there was nothing extra about them. It was two dudes in hats with revolvers and they didn't matter to me. And Dave yeah. found that one in a book that's all about cultural reference. It's Elvira. It's all about cultural references and touchstones and all that. And that Dave brought in something that was such a, I have a friend who's a, a sitcom showrunner and we've edited a bunch of things together and he introduced me to the concept of the free laugh. Yeah. That's a free laugh, man. Like it costs you nothing. And the audience yeah. is going to laugh. You know, he's like, do, always, always do the laugh that costs you literally nothing. And then the audience is waiting for it. And, you know, so, uh, well, yeah. so yeah, it looked, it always it was, used to say it, on set that like, you know, my maxim was like, oh, well, we always have one disaster and one happy accident. Yeah. Um, so whenever something went wrong, we just go, oh, that's the disaster. And we've had it, take that box, move on. Um, yeah. And that would generally make everybody feel better whenever something broke or, you know, was running late or went wrong because something always does. Yeah, no, exactly. And you, you adapt, you know, I, I was making a low budget movie in 91 and it was, you know, it was a boilerplate exploitation spy movie type thing. And uh, we had this very complex three, four page scene started with a complicated dialogue scene. And then there was a, you know, a little confrontation with the bad guy. Huge scene. And uh, the, we ran out of time and we ran out of sun. And I had to get this five page scene in one shot. And the one shot that we came up with was better than what I would have done if I had had five hours to shoot it. The shot list I had, when I look at it now, I'm like, but that was boring. The one -er was great. <laughs> you know, Coming out of music video, you're like, well, like, can we do it in a one -er? Um yeah. Because, you know, out of music videos is a lot of like cinematography wankery. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone has to do their one shot video sooner or later. Yeah. Well, we should probably wrap up. We, we're, we're long past our hour mark, uh, but this has been absolutely lovely. We usually go around at the end and let everyone say what they got next and where they can be found easily on the interwebs. 
Pepos, why don't you start? Sure. Um, yeah, you can uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Pepos D. It's my last name, first initial, or David Pepos Comics on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe to my newsletter, Pep Talks, at bit.ly slash pep news, um, or visit my website, davidpepos.com. And uh, yeah, you can tell your local comic shop to uh, pre order issues three and four of Scout's Honor. Uh, the codes for that are Jan 211049 for issue three and Feb 210990 for issue four. Um, you memorized yeah. those, huh? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excited right. to be here. That was great, David. And Alex? Cool. Um, I'm on most social media as Alex DeCampi, A L E X D E C A M P I. Um, I've got, uh, as I said, Bad Karma on Panel Syndicate, which you can download right now for free. Uh, you can pick up Dracula Motherfucker uh, from Image um, if you like 70s exploitation goodness. Uh, Maddie with Duncan Jones if you're a sci fi fan from the Z2 comics. Uh, if you're into Autobio, the True War Stories anthology I edited also from Z2 comics just arrived. Um, what I have coming up next, I have uh, The Backups, which is a YA graphic novel coming from First Second. And then I think next on the release is uh, Heartbreak Incorporated, which is my second novel, prose novel, out from Rebellion Solaris. And I think that's out in late summer. Not 100% sure. Nice. Uh, I can be found at davidavalonefreelance.com, and all of the links to all of the things are there. Um, Dynamite still hasn't announced my next comic, which I've now written three out of four issues of, so when they're going to actually solicit that but it's really great and i can't talk about it because it hasn't been announced yet uh and i'm working on uh some other stuff um cooking up some new stuff with <coughs> eastman and fi finishing up the second volume of drawing blood uh, as we speak and we'll have that out to the kickstarter folks and then both volumes of that will be in bookstores and etc ryland I am uh, Ryland Grant, at Ryland Grant on all forms of social media, R-Y-L-E-N-D-G-R-A-N-T. If you're listening, I always spell it because it's not a real name. My parents drunkenly arranged letters and saddled me with it. No one knows how to spell it, so don't feel bad about it. It's also in the show notes, so uh, look down at that. Uh, the, um, the Ringo Award-winning uh, aberrant and the four-time uh, back cover. Uh, the four-time uh, Ringo-nominated Banjax uh, are all available in fine comic shops uh, and, uh, you know, via Amazon and Comixology and all that fun stuff. Uh, you can get uh, uh, my latest and greatest, the uh, astral projection thriller, The Jump, and um, uh, my Fargo-esque crime drama, The Peacekeepers, uh, online via Backerkit uh, at the moment. It's um, uh, The Peacekeepers, one word, dot backerkit.com. Uh, you can get those there, anything you missed, uh, and uh, all sorts of uh, cool, signed, aberrant, and banjack stuff, all that good noise. Um, more to come, uh, more to be announced soon. Um, yeah, I think uh, I still think my movie's uh, on track for uh, the Venice Film Festival, assuming, there, uh, assuming there's a, a, uh, a the Venice Emile uh, Hirsch Film Festival. The Emile Hirsch movie, uh, uh, State of Consciousness. So um, we, uh, we we shall see. Uh, uh, COVID, uh, COVID willing, uh, uh, you'll right. see it there. Uh, and, and soon after, um, I don't know how movies are going to be released anymore, but uh, but uh, I'm interested to see how it, how it all shakes out. Um, other than that, uh, yeah been good guys thanks uh thanks for coming on thanks for listening thanks for watching guys uh we'll see you soon awesome right. sounds Thank good you. take care thanks. if you're watching us on youtube be sure to smash that like button if you're listening to us on apple Podcasts, spotify or other fine purveyors of ear crack please leave us a five-star review and wherever you're watching and or listening subscribe 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 we'll see you back here next week for more madcap hijinks on the writer's block <laughs>